just uh, exhale and go with the flow. I don't have uh, this pretty slides, which I would hope. And, uh, and as such, I've, I've switched gears a little bit. I recognize many of your names. It's really good to see you again. I would like this to be more of an interaction than me telling you what's going on because team coaching is really a social event. It is something that you're brought into a situation. You are trying to deliver value for the client, whatever the client thinks that is. And then you go on a journey to help them achieve what they want to achieve. And that's the challenge many times with being dropped in into a uh, team coaching environment. It's that there is so much information that you need. So one thing about these tools is that there's many TAP 360, or sorry, 360 tools. I've, I am registered in two of them. One of them is from uh, Renewal and Associates. Associates, it's with uh, systemic team coaching. And then my favorite, which is with Dr. Claire, it's the TAP 360 uh, assessment. What these provide you, and there, and, and the thing, I think the thing to keep in mind is that these are both they're, they're tools that can give you, that they can, they can free you, but they can also put you into a corner. And that's the thing that, uh, that's why the dance, and it's very, very important not just to use that tool as something that you rely on, because you're all really good coaches. You know how to coach individuals. You know how to coach teams. You've got experience. And just because it's on a piece of paper or it follows a stream that, you know, is, you know, as, as a result of the data that you've collected, doesn't necessarily mean you need to follow it. So that's the one thing I want to uh, give you permission to free yourself because it is just data. And sometimes that data may help you, sometimes that data may not. And that's the other thing I'd really like to stress in this, in, in this environment, and this is the thing I forgot to say, this is a safe environment, right? So there's no such thing as a right answer. There's no such thing as a wrong answer. There are observations, which hopefully will lead to other observations and good conversation. And that's what team coaching is about. It's really a non-threatening way to get the team members to interact with one another, understand one another, and then accept one another and then move forward. And that's where I've really been successful in the past. So to introduce myself, and I'm how excited I am. So I, uh, I have a master's in history. Uh, which is, and people say, well, why is that important? It was in strategic history. So I've always worked with strategy in high level groups. Then I did an MBA where I learned a whole lot of useless facts and figures. I never learned how to interact with people. You know, I was never taught how to manage people. Then after that, I thought the thing to do is get some technical education. So I'm a certified internal auditor, I'm a certified risk manager, I'm a certified internal control auditor. Again, I got the technical skill, but the thing that was never ever taught or inculcated or developed was one-on-one -on -one skills. Uh, I was very fortunate. I went to Catter and I started with the Minister of Energy and Industry, Chairman of the Board of Catter Petroleum, as well as the Managing Director for some time and President of OPEC. And this is not to burnish my own ego, but what that allowed me to do is I worked with 39 boards and 39 executive teams. And I had to very, very quickly figure out how to learn how to work with individuals who were nationals, who were expatriates, who had different cultures. And that's where my real education came in. And at the end of my term uh, with the minister, I realized I wanted to, you know, I wanted to take that education and or that work education and augment it with some, uh, let's say, certifications. So I did, uh, I did the basic uh, ICF uh, training coaching. Then I found Claire and I really told, you know, I told her, I said, I want to focus on businesses and work with teams because that's my experience. So she's been very good in helping me develop my team coaching skills. Then I took WebEx so that I could get a, you know, be hygienically okay. And I learned systemic teaching. So 
that is important, I think, for you to realize that I'm one of you. Uh, and, and I have worked both as a practitioner as well as someone as a student and a team in that. For me, TAP 360s really uh, resonate because most of the people that I work with in the energy sector typically are finance guys, they're, uh, they're engineers, and they're process-based people. So they like to have a little bit of data to start because a lot of them are not used to the touchy-feely side coaching. You know? just, and, and it's not a good thing or a bad thing, it's just they're not used to expressing their, their, their emotions and, and dealing with them and then dealing with somebody else's emotions, which is really important in team coaching because there, in many cases, there are issues that are under the surface that are not being recognized, not being addressed, team leaders trying to manage it and spinning plates, then the team members are trying to spin plates. And that's why I like the TAP 360 because it gives you much like a spreadsheet or sorry, financial statements, a line in the sand from which you can work. Now, just like any other financial statements, it contains information that can be perceived as good as well as bad. And sometimes that is the challenge. So many of you, I, I recognize, I've, we've done the TAP 360 and it's a lot of data. And as a team coach, you have to be cognizant of what do I want to use and when do I want to use it? Uh, some people say, well, you know, I'm just going to give the TAP 360 report and just let it, you know, let it fly. Okay, well, if that works for you. That's great. But be deliberate in the way that you use that. Because I remember with Dr. Claire, uh, when she was the president of the ICF uh, Doha Counter chapter, we did a debrief of the TAP 360 and it took us three and a half hours. And it would, now we were using it to learn, but there's a lot of data. And the problem with when you see data on a piece of paper, because I think most of us are just human, we look at it and we go, that's not a positive statement, right? And that's where a team coach will come in and say, well, no, it's just a statement. Is it really you know, positive or negative? And so I think that from a team coaching perspective, this gives you a lot of information in a very quick period of time. And that's what TAP360 is for each they sort of, you know, we're, we're always looking at coaches to develop self-awareness, with self-awareness, to make our people more aware, right? And this is where a TAP 360 report comes in place because everybody has answered questions about something that relates to their team experience. And now as a team coach, you're confronted with all of this information that's, oh, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm now not entirely equal, but you've got enough information to know what's going on. Now, that's one thing to keep in mind about TAP 360 reports. A lot of people, like me included, know how to game answers. And gaming answers mean we will choose answers to either make us look better or maybe may help us reinforce a position, make us look right, whatever, right? So that's one thing that team coaches have to be aware of as well. And that's the lucky, I think, the fortunate thing about TAP 360 that you get a lot of people inputting data and their perceptions of other teams. But I think that's important because sometimes, let's say there's a team leader and we have a, a key stakeholder and the relationship's not that good or the team leader is new. They may answer slightly differently in order for them to look better or, or, or what, right? So you have to be careful of that. The other thing that I find that's very important is the context in which you're operating. Are you working with a business that is a family owned business? Is it owned by a sole proprietor? Is it a public company? Is it a government entity? Is it a non-government entity? And why is that important? Because the key stakeholder might be the owner of the family business. And then it doesn't matter in many cases of, let's say how you want to change culture and things like that, because it may not happen. It may, but it may not. If you're in a public company and depending on where you are in that company. So I've worked primarily with boards and executive teams. So they're very, well, I shouldn't say they're very, they can be, have their minds open to change if they see there's a benefit. Oftentimes they say, well, this is really good for me. My team's down below me. 
And then the team down below who are confronted with their team coaching sometimes don't know. You know. It's like, oh, where's this coming from? So again, a lot of this is about opening communication, trying to push down the, uh, the barriers and getting people to understand. Now, part of the challenge that we have as well is that we're dealing with ego. So I find that boards, directors have a different level of ego than managers do, let's say executive teams. Then if you go down through the organization, ego, you know, ego represents itself in people micromanaging perhaps and doing things to make sure that they look good and they don't get fired. You've got all of this stuff to contend with. That's why I like TAP 360s because it helps you cut through that and it helps you build your own picture so that you can best serve your client. Now, Blair, if you could make me co-host and uh, put up the sample report or, or I, uh, I was able to find one, I can, I can put it up on the screen if you like. You're already co-host. Oh, I am? And whichever's easier for you. Would you like me to share or do you want to share? Let, let me let me see if I can do it. It just takes one second. Okay. What do you... Perfect. Uh, perfect. Okay. So... Now, now, don't you hate when you see new things flashing on somebody else's computer? I do. So, okay. So this is the the, the key uh, you know the, of, of uh, the data that is going to be will be represented, and it's the thing you have to keep in mind. What do you see as overall patterns? Where does the team see itself as being more or less effective? What ways does this compare to the data from other stakeholders? And what are you curious about? And that's the thing. Always be curious. All you know. Always ask questions and. Hopefully you've established a rapport with your team leader so that you can ask these questions naively so that, you know, the part of the problem with posing questions is that sometimes you'll, you'll try to formulate it so that it sounds right and it doesn't offend. And hopefully you get a relationship with the team leader. Yeah, I know or, or something to that. Because that, that then uh, allows the communication to be at a level and I think at uh, an authenticity that you need to help the team. Now, this particular report, I don't know if any of you are, uh, how, I, I can't recall how many of you have exposure to it. What this report does is it looks at skills, knowledge, behaviors, action, results, transition planning and reflection. And then it has got a questionnaire at the end, which is like uh, essentially a systemic hope. And I'm going to go right down to yeah, let's see if I can. Okay. So any questions at this point? You've all, you've, you've all been awfully quiet and attentive. And if you have a question. Or if there's any sort of clarification or an observation, I'd really like to hear from you. Because this is, please go ahead, Joanne. Or does that mean everything good? Everything's <laughs> good, Aaron. I'm just saying okay. everything. Okay. Okay. I can share what I was thinking about just then. <laughs> yeah, please. Which was, I, I, just, I was just meeting an executive coach who's dealing with it absolutely toxic board situation and um and I was well she's a Ned on the board and she's also happens to be a coach and I was just thinking how useful it would be for her to have this data and I was trying to imagine how do you sell to a bunch of possibly narcissistic egocentric board members the concept that they should give two hoots about what other people think and gather some data and like get a 360 and be confronted with some home truths. So I'm just trying to imagine how you'd actually pitch the idea even. So it's one, I, I, I really appreciate that question because that is something I contend with all the time when I talk to boards because uh, most boards, uh, I, I don't mean to be negative, but they are quite happy cruising at 30,000 feet and think they're doing a great job. 
It's only until, and, and you can't convince them that maybe they need some self-reflection. You can't convince, you cannot try and, and convince someone that they need to look deeper at who they are or what they are. It's very, very difficult. It's usually what you want to do is you want to uh, time your approach at a time of crisis. And it may make us seem like ambulance chasers in that way, but when they've had a crisis, that's when they're open and reflective. And the motivation, I'm sad to say, is, is uh, in large part that it, it's, a, it's one coin, but there's a flip side. One, they want to look good, and they want to avoid uh, not looking good. So that is part of the challenge. I feel for your colleague because it's going to be very difficult for her to have conversations with a group that you described, and not too, you know, not too nicely, as you know, narcissists. They're, they're not. Gonna, they're, 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 be honest, unless there's a crisis and, and, and their reputations are on the line, it's 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 very very difficult, Emma. And I'd be happy to help you know with your colleague, and if you want to make an introduction. Uh, but I have found it's usually the board that one they've had a board change, so they've had let's say two or three members come in. So the board wants to inculcate the new people. And the really good way of doing that is we're finding out what they do and then giving them, you know, giving the nomination and the governance chair feedback as well as the chairman of the board or chairperson of the board. And then hopefully they'll, 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 they'll grab on it because they, you know, they, they have a sense of pride and they want to do well. Uh, or like what's just happened in Canada, we had the National Ice Hockey Association, the whole board was fired because it had allowed management to get away with some pretty dubious uh, uh, payouts to victims for uh, team-based sexual assault players. So they got rid of them and now, now they wanna know how to do it the best way possible, right? They want to make sure that everything's okay. So I'm, you know, it's, it's you, at least my experience, very infrequent about your marriage. Nobody, you know, you know, when you first meet someone, my marriage is great, you know, but if they become your friend over a couple of years and then they'll start telling you little things that could improve, but no one's ever really going to tell you about that, how bad it is. How does that resonate with you, Emma? I know it may not be the answer you're, you're, you're looking for, but what do you, yeah, so how, how does that land? Cutting, yeah, the sound cut a bit for me towards the lot to the end. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I think you're making a comparison to marriage at one point, were you? Yeah, just in terms of just using it as a metaphor that you know, it's very difficult to ask someone the state of their marriage, just like it is very difficult yeah. to ask a board member, you know, what's the state of their board? And it's usually crisis that will facilitate change. So they're having a hostile takeover and they're basically using my friend as the fixer, saviour, and they've asked her to step up to be the chairman of the board. And this could be the perfect, because she doesn't want to be the chairman of the board. So this could be a place where she could say, well, if we're gonna have a new chairman and it's not gonna be me, let's have a thorough look in the mirror about what, what we need from a chairman. Maybe it'd be helpful to us to really understand what we've got in terms of what we have now. Could that be a way in for her to? The, the, the challenge I see, and Claire, I see you, so I will, uh, you know, give me a sec. So the, the challenge that I see is that if that, that initiative has to come from her and she would be the one to have to stick handle it because it's very difficult. Well, or maybe they do that assessment before and then they let the chairperson know what needs to be, you know, fixed within the board in order for it to uh, successfully navigate this takeover. You know, that's, that's the way as well. Say, so, hey, look, we're, we're, at, we're at a crisis situation. We need to know how we, how we can improve. So let us uh, do an, uh, an assessment and an evaluation of what we're like, because it's also good. Then you can get the internal stakeholders. So like executive team would be, you know, would, would, would be able to participate you get external stakeholders, so there are other shareholders. You know, they 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 could really make a a, a quite a uh, investigation 
with an eye on developing a roadmap for the future. So, yeah. Thanks. It's possible. No, it's a, it's a good idea, Emily. Claire, please. You are going in and out a little bit, Arne. Um, we'll let you know if it Sorry happens again. That. And I know it's not ideal, but maybe take your camera off. But we'll see how it goes because sometimes it's okay and sometimes it's not. The other um, things I was going to add to that was also um, I share it with a sample sharing that this is a, a team level profile. It's not about individuals like the Belbin, you know, you're a finisher and I'm a plant and that type of one. It's looking at the whole team together and the team leader can either be identifiable in the data or we can just leave that and they are in with the team in the data. So that can support psychological safety. And then sharing that it's mapped to extensive research on high impact and high performing teams globally. And that it's been used with PwC and Lego and uh, a very big NGO in Qatar called Qatar Foundation and also um, an international court. So that type of thing sometimes gets gravitas. So it's the emotional side, but also the, the data side of um, you know, this has been used in other places. I hope that helps. The other thing is, if it's used with NGOs, we give it complimentary. And then you as the coach just charge whatever you do for your time to either just feed it back or actually to do the team coaching afterwards as well from the data. Thank you, Claire. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And and again, not having the... the uh, uh, benefit of my slide deck. I appreciate you bringing that up. And please feel free to, to add at any time. So that's the other thing about return on investment. And I, I, I'm glad Claire brought it up because I have uh, had a conversation with an executive team who was reluctant to do the TAP 360. And I said, well, okay, let's put it this way. If I'm going to ask all of these questions and I'm going to spend an hour and a half with each one of your your members, your executive team, and there's seven of you. Uh, that's you know that's a lot of time. Then I need to analyze it, and I'm I'm going to add, you know, and then I need to I need to create a report for you. And I said that's just it's it's uh, a great time consuming. So I would prefer if we could use this tap recently because I can shorten that process. I can get a number, or I can receive a number of let's say impressions from the data which I think will be different uh, than if I were to do seven different interviews. And they agreed. They said, yeah, that's a good idea. Unfortunately, I didn't get the business. But that's, that's one place where you can say, okay, if my time's worth three to $400 an hour, and I'm just doing data collection, you know, they're going to probably ask you, well, can you spend less on the data collection? So you, then you get into you know, a, a, a bit of, backing and forthing, which delays the negotiation rather than saying, hey, I've got this way of getting the data, building the self-awareness that I can share with you in a report form. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Anything else that uh, comes to mind before I go into the, the report itself? Okay, thank you for the feedback, Emma. So, um, This report is broken down into the way that uh, in, into a number of categories. Now I'm going to look at one just to give you an example of, of uh, the, the data that is collected. And we'll look at two or three of these questions and then hopefully establish a bit of dialogue with one another as to what this means. So as you can see, we've got this section one that's here. We've got a question. He uh, regularly spends time defining clarifying scope. You've got the respondent numbers, team leader, key stakeholder, and general stakeholder. Those are those uh, colored uh, uh, bars. Then on the right side, you'll see member type and the mean and the numbers of who's unable to comment, which correlates to the members in the box. The one internal stakeholder was unable, 
one of the others was unable, so that's a total of two, and then you get the scores. The interesting thing about these bars is that they reflect the scores, and in the case of the team members, you'll see that it's zero. And one student said, well, and I forgot, this is at the very beginning, said, well, no, none of the team members answered. Well, actually the team members, they canceled each other out. So it's not, it's not that they agree or that they disagree. It's just that, you know, they don't have a strong opinion one way or the other. And you'll see that the question, team regularly spends time defining and clarifying scope, which for all of us should be pretty important. Team leader says, yep, we're pretty strong. Team members are neutral. And then the key stakeholder is negative. And this is one thing that I want to bring up as well, is that depending on the type of key stakeholder you have, this may not go over well with your team. You know, they may look at this and go, oh my gosh, is this a performance thing? And that's one thing that you have to be careful of because you don't want to put your team and you know the, the team itself into a stressful situation. And it's also, and I, 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 I point this out, it's one, it's the first question of the nine questions that they've answered. So that's the other thing to keep in mind is that they, they have to place it where it's relevant. Now, anything that comes up for uh, for you when you see this, the, the, this bar chart? Any questions, any comments, observations? So in of itself, it's a good piece, a useful piece of information. And I'm a systemic team coach trained that way. I also am a systems person and I believe in processes because that's how you create values and follow a process and do it consistently. And to me, if the team isn't spending time defining and clarifying scope, that could mean that there's some sort of process issue, maybe, right? Just on the uh, first glance when I look at this. And it could be, you know, uh, the and, and then the second point that I bring up is I look at the team leader and the key stakeholder because there's quite a difference there. So what does that mean? Uh, you know, and again, that's where the context is. It, context is important. Is the team leader new? Uh, you know, uh, or uh, that's one question. And then, what is the relationship between the key, uh, sorry, the team leader and the key stakeholder? Is it something that's positive? Is it negative? Uh, some people say, well, oh, clearly it looks like it's negative because they've answered negative. They could just simply not know, right? That's the other. Thing. We have to make sure that what we interpret, we interpret in the best, most neutral way possible. You can't go to either positive or negative. It, it's at this point, it's just data. And maybe the key stakeholder just isn't, you know, doesn't have a good management staff and doesn't know how to ask the team leader for updates on, you know, progress of his team or her team. Sorry for being sorry. So, you know, it's, it's really, Who, uh, you know, you know is, is this reflective of a serious issue or is it just that they don't know? And we won't know until we continue going down the path. Now, here, now I'm getting an internet unstable. Am I still, uh, can you hear me okay? Thank you. Thank you for the, oh, you're having trouble? No, it's just going a little bit slow and fast at certain points. Shoot. And I spend a lot of money on this internet connection for the kids to gain. So uh, if you give me one second, I'm just going to go to my settings and see if I can. Okay. I'm trying to uh, reduce other parts of my uh, system usage, but I, I don't know if I can. Let me turn off the phone with you. Maybe that's competing. So. Here we are, second question. Team manages systems, processes, and resources effectively. And systems are the way things together, processes are actions and steps, whilst resources include things such as finances and people. Now, this is interesting to me because the team leader is negative, the team members are positive, and the key stakeholder is negative. 
So it's it on one hand above the question is the team spends time defining and clarifying scope, yet there's not a system or a process. So you'd assume, at least I do, that the question one indicates the process, and question two, well, you know, what what does that mean? And I think that's fundamentally what this is really about, is that you can go to the team leader and say, okay, you gave me an answer up above, or you, you know, we're defining scope regularly, but then you're going, you know, you've disagreed with that we have, you know, that we manage our system resources effectively. What does that mean? And that's fundamentally what this, this tool is all about is just asking those questions with the mind of working with your team to get the, the questions or to get them on, let's say, an understanding of where they are and where they need to go. They're an awfully quiet bunch. Any questions? Okay, done. So now here's another thing. Uh, if we look at the team together, have the right skill set to effectively serve their purposes to team. I think this is quite interesting because the key stakeholder agrees. So does the team member and the team leader. They're all aligned, which is quite unusual. You know, they 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 believe that together they can serve their purpose as a team. And for my for my perspective, it's it's important because teams often will not have people on like part of their teams who have the skill sets to deliver on, on their work and deliver on their you know the so this team is saying yeah we've got that which it means that there's no need to spend much time on this And then the team adapts skillfully to unfamiliar, unpredictable, complex, and challenging situations. Team leader and the team members are in alignment. Uh, the key stakeholder either it doesn't have an opinion either way. The internal and external stakeholders are very, very positive. So, as a as a team coach, what would this be saying to you? That on so, the whole, they are pretty resilient. Agreed, and and so pretty resilient. The thing that I, I look at, uh, again, being one of those people who always, you know, who examines the outlying answer, the key stakeholder hasn't said positively or negatively. How would you interpret that? Is, is it just a question? Sorry, go ahead. I'd want to dive into that and um, seek permission to speak with the key stakeholder. Usually they're the executive sponsor. And if they neither agree nor disagree with that statement, um, I'm curious around that. And that's one thing that uh, as a team coach, you may want to work on at the beginning is establishing permission to speak with the key stakeholder in a safe uh, way uh, meaning that you would let the team leader know what you're discussing with the key stakeholder and why, so that there's no worry uh, about, let's say, an, another coalition being built that they're undermining. But that information can give, you know, can be, I think, it's so invaluable because if the key stakeholder says, "Well, I see this," and the team leader and the team members don't know what that that piece of information is, that can also close the loop in so many ways and allow them to perform better. And I think that's one thing that many, in my mind, people have difficulty with in that in the work environment, uh, being a team has, has a social function as well as a performance function. 
And sometimes team members may become too focused socially and not so much on the performance or vice versa. So that's where the information from the key stakeholder can come in and help with, you know, I don't see that they're adapting to unfamiliar situations. Team leaders and the team members are, and all it is is a piece of information that connects the, like finishes the sentence or completes the circuit for the key stakeholder. And then they go, oh, wait a minute. And, and, and I, I also want to uh, identify the fact that you don't always want to create something that's sunny and happy because it is the start of a journey. So it could also be for you a starting point. Say, okay, key stakeholder is not you. This team is let's say, at a level of maturity. You know, it's, it's good, but it's not very mature. How do we get them and how long will that journey take? So again, it's something that it, it, it is, uh, I think the, the desire as a coach to deliver immediate results in the team environment may not happen as quickly as you like, because we all want immediate response. It may take some time. And that's one thing, because unfamiliar, unpredictable, complex, challenging situations, you may have just got the team at the end of uh, their quarter end, and everything is smooth and ticky to boo. They're starting to you know, ramp up again for the next quarter. They need a week to rest. They're going to start selling again, or they're going to, you know, they don't have to do anything because they're accounting team. So that's the other thing. What does, you know, an unfamiliar situation or a complex challenging situation mean? And how does it fit within their business? Now I come to this question, the team draws upon the skill of all members. And you see that team leader, team member, piece to everybody says, yes, you know, they draw, we agree. Keeping in mind what you've just uh, seen, how does this resonate with you? So from my perspective, and I'll, I'll, I, I look and I, I want to know the relationship between the key stakeholder and the, and the team leader, because the key stakeholder sees that the team is drawing upon the skills of all of its members and is responding quite positively to that, yes, they do. So what, what again, going back to what Claire asked in terms of the permission, the key stakeholder to speak with them, like why are you know what is it that they're seeing? Because I think there's a specific flavor there that will help with the team, uh, the relationship with the team leader, as well as the team members. I think it also brings in a so here's the data right now in this moment. Where do you need to be to serve your stakeholders even more impactfully? Or is that okay now? Because to get there, you've already done some work. That's a great point, Claire. And that's the where I will jump down to the bottom summary of section one. When I get to that point, that's when I ask that specific question. So like, where do you need, you know, where are you now? Where do you need to be? What is, you know, what is it that is in, you know, that, that you feel you need to do? Now, the other thing is, you'll notice that in this, the key stakeholder, it's not really as negative as those other bars have shown previously, a lot of the minus ones. It's really, really sort of, in my mind, the key stakeholder is aware that improvement, may, you know, something, something needs to be done, but it's not drastic. And that's why. I think you have to be careful when you present this data to your team leader and the team members. It may be valuable to go to the summary first so that they have an anchor by which they can interpret the data in the questions previously. Because this is not nearly as negative as if we go to the very first question. I'm sorry for making you seasick, but you know, 
here we go, team leader, really positive, key stakeholder, really negative. If you see that right at the beginning, that might psychologically uh, yeah, impair you as, as being open to the process. But if you see this down here, go, oh, okay, there's room for improvement. A whole lot better than, oh my goodness, we're at a minus one. Here there's room for improvement. So again, it's also a lot about the psychology of the presentation. And then we pull in everything else, the contact, the business, all of that sort of stuff. So it, it helped you become a, uh, an honest broker and establish yourself as a trusted person that they can rely on. Sean, I hate to point at you. Anything coming up for you when, when uh, in, in this section? Anything that? So I'm, I, I, I've been noticing that there seems to be almost always a difference between the key stakeholder and the internal and external stakeholders. And of course, the question in my head is, is the key stakeholder also a member of the internal or external group? Um, but then I'm, I really am curious what's going on for the key stakeholder, even going back to the um, the previous slide where they don't seem to be seeing the, the, the team operating as a team, but yet they see that they are taking care of the work, um, that they're meeting their what the stakeholder expects, that key stakeholder. So I really want to dive into what is this stakeholder individual or group seeing, experiencing, what do they need? What do they want? What are their hopes? Um, in what way are they being supported or not? And really, what are they seeing and, and observing and feeling? Because it seems to be different relative to many of the other um, respondent groups? That is an awesome set of questions, Sean. I really like that because I, I look at that internal stakeholder and we can imagine the context that that might be in, right? It could be that uh, they're, you know, the team that we're working with could be supporting the internal stakeholder somehow commercially. And they're just very happy that these guys are working and delivering their promises. Or, you know, so there's, there's a, and, and that's just one possible example. And, and going back to the, you know, the, the, the establishing, it's what kind of business is it? What is the context? Are they, you know, are they doing well? Are they doing poorly? There's so many things that will help you, uh, you know, maybe place those questions and then ask the right ones of the key stakeholders. And going back again to what uh, Clara said, you need to get access to the key stakeholder. When I was uh, with WebEx uh, doing the systemic team coaching uh, course, both uh, Peter Hawkins and David Clutterbuck said, always get permission to talk to the key stakeholder. And given the way that I've worked for the last 12 years, that's exactly what I do. I always make sure I know who the key stakeholder is and that I have permission. I make sure that the team leader understands the condition, why I'm speaking with them, all of that. But it helps you then get the answers to the questions that you had. What are you feeling? What are you seeing? You know, what are you tasting? You know, all of that stuff, which is really important because the key stakeholder may be the one who uh, is responsible for the team's bonus or their continued employment. Who knows, right? And that's one thing you want to help the team. You can't, right? you, obviously you don't promise that. That's always in the back of your head. How do I support that team leader and that team? Yes, Claire. I've done something um, unusual with a team I'm coaching right now. It's a team of teams and contracting with all of them. We've had the exec sponsor, who's the executive director over those teams in the room, not only for the feedback, but for some of the coaching sessions as well, when they can make it. And that's been a really interesting experience. And it's something that I will uh, bring up in my supervision 
in terms of the pros and cons of that, but the feedback um, from the team of teams as well, the ones who have had casual conversations afterwards said it's better because we're getting airtime with them as well that's even diarised. So, so I'll let you know how that one goes, but it's definitely an interesting way to get the key stakeholders' um, thoughts uh, to everyone. See, and that's one of the things that uh, as a team coach, uh, and I'm glad you brought this up, it's the exposure to the management team or their, you know, the person who's responsible. I think it does lend gravitas, but it also shows that, you know, to the, you know, uh, team members are able to show to the key stakeholder that they're doing work, that, you know, they're, they're contributing. I think that one, just in that, uh, in that framework, that they can have the conversations that are more, are, are, are deeper once the key stakeholder is really aware that, yeah, they are doing their stuff because we're oftentimes we're removed from our teams. So we, you know, we have a, let's say a supervisory relationship, but we're not really working with the team as a team leader, or sorry, as a key stakeholder to see what their challenges are, what they're, you know, what, what's going on, what are their, their, you know, what are they happy about? What do they need to, you know, support with? So I think that's a really great idea. And uh, the only time I've seen that it recently is uh, at Catter Petroleum when the managing director had a, what he called the uh, was it, uh, corporate leadership team meeting, the CLT meeting. That was, but that was only once a quarter and that was a highly scripted uh, event. There wasn't really the uh, opportunity to sit back and talk about business, you know, and talk about personalities. Now, uh, and Sean, I appreciate you uh, responding to my direct question. I know I put you on the spot and I, and I really appreciate that. Thanks so very much. Because that's, yeah. see, that, that, that's the, I think that's also the challenge with having something in front of you like this is that it's it's data, but it, and without the context, it, it doesn't have a lot of meaning. And, you know, we're, uh, we're that's what I'm trying to show is that, You've got these data points, but it's really the questioning, the curiosity, the, the desire to, if you sense something that you're uncomfortable, follow it. Because I want to know why the internal stakeholder is always so darn positive. You know, is it, are they truly happy? Or, you know, did they just sign, you know, did they just do the form because they, they were told to do it, you know? And I know I'm being cynical and I'm offering really two extremes, but that's the kind of thing because you know, if, if, and, and what is that internal stakeholder? Are they key to that, you know, that team success? You know, that's the kind of stuff that the, this data helps and help, you know, and, and it stimulates your curiosity. And I think that's part of the challenge as well. Uh, when, you know, people go, well, yeah, I've got this big report and oh my goodness, there's a lot of it. It's, you know what, it's just data and it's just meant to make you curious. And oftentimes uh, people say, well, you know, but for uh, uh, completeness sake, I should go through all 29 pages. Like, no, not necessarily. You know, if you've got a good relationship with the team leader and you're all coaches, so you know how to ask questions, right? We, you know, you, can, you, can, you, you already know that intuitively, how to ask powerful questions. This just helps you, I think, refine those questions and maybe shorten the amount of time that you spend getting data and establishing a, let's say, a baseline. And it allows you then to start working really effectively with the team. And let's see, I think the other thing as well, depends on how long this, this, your, your, your engagement is. You know, if you've got a 12 month engagement, you may wanna start with this report at the beginning and then uh, three quarters of the way through to show that there's been development and improvement. If it's only a three month, uh, you know, engagement, and it's because there's a real, let's say, uh, a serious problem that needs to be solved, you may only get a chance to do it once, you know? So again, all, and, and, and I know I'm beating the dead or the contacts force here, but it's really about context and, you know, how you can work best to support these people because they are your clients. And that's one thing, uh, 
again, going back to the key stakeholder, be very careful that you establish the communication with the key stakeholder with the full understanding of the team leader. Because the minute the team leader begins to doubt your sincerity or thinks that you're feeding information, you may be in, uh, you know, you, 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 you've created a world of, of trouble that is difficult to get out. And I would recommend that uh, the first couple of meetings, if, you, if, if the team uh, key stakeholder is amenable and so is the key stakeholder, bring them together, you know, meet together so that they understand, you know, that there's nothing that, you know, there's nothing secret. And I think that's what many people are so worried about. It's like, well, what are you saying about me? what's being said? You know, and you need to, and because the team leader is that person who's responsible for the performance, you can understand that anxiety. So Claire, I have no idea how much time we've got left. So we've got about um, 15 minutes. And okay. I was thinking, what if we just scan slowly, just literally looking at the report and then go to the narrative. Um, and Samira was going to just blurt a few ethical things around it as well, if there's time for that. Sure. Well, if you don't mind, why don't I just scroll really quickly down to the first question in the because you know what we'll do is we'll give everyone, and, and this is what I'll, I'll offer everyone. Uh, can we send them a copy of this report? And if they Absolutely. want, give them my email address, and I'd be more sure. than happy to spend time with them to understand or answer their questions. Because I I strongly believe in this tool. I think it 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 really helps the quality of the information. Because there's new word I learned information asymmetry, right? So you don't know what's going on with the team. This will help. And if I can help you make sense of that and the report, I'm more than happy to do so. So I'm just gonna go Fabulous. very quickly. Yeah, so That's we important. can, we'll share with you the actual sample report um, and also the brochure, because that gives more information as well. And just while I'm um, scanning down there, um, we've got this in Arabic and English, we're working on other languages, but also you can have up to 300 people rating a team. We've never had that many. We've had 46 is the maximum. However, um, it, if it's a team of teams, that can be useful to have that capacity if needed. So I'll be honest, this first question, uh, one individual who I was uh, did an assessment said, no, it's an awfully negative question to start, you know, the assessment with. <laughs> and I went, hmm, interesting. Uh, I don't know if it is or isn't, but interesting that you, you brought this up. And what I think is more important, it's not that, they, you know, in a way you're, you're they've, they've answered all of these questions. And now you're getting them to think, what do they need to stop? Because oftentimes that can be a very easy thing for the team to truly stop doing and improve. So again, the it's broken down by team leader, key stakeholder, the internal, external stakeholder, the team members. And the question is, what does the team need to stop? And what if this doesn't stop? And the answers can be quite illuminating in the way that they're written. So when I read the first answer, possibly stop creating new programs and products and instead start consolidating and further enhancing the ones that are there. That needs to be balanced with staying ahead of competitors in terms of producing new products and programs. As a leader, do I need to stop micromanaging sometimes? And it's like, wow. For me, that's quite telling because that person is really focused on the process of managing the team, not necessarily focused on, you know, helping the team with the exception of the last question or answer. As a leader, do I need to stop micromanaging times? And for me, I think that is a great opening to start, you know, an exploration with the team lead. You know, what makes you say that? You know, why are you saying that to me? What, what, you know, what kind of feedback? What you know, there, there's so many ways that you can explore that 
but I think it's uh, to me, it, 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 I I don't mind that it's you know uh, it could be perceived as a negative question because I think it really brings it to a head. What do we need to do to improve? And then I like what the uh, key stakeholder says: attempting too much at the same time that everything being done at the last minute. So that seems to me to be a scheduling issue, not necessarily a team issue, right? Could be wrong, doesn't matter. Again, it's an exploration. And you can then bring that out, that question up with the key stakeholder. When you answered this, you, you know, you provided the answer of attempting too much at the same time. Can you explore uh, that with me a little bit? Can you give me some background? Can you, because maybe it was just a one-time event. Maybe it's consistent, right? We can't, and I think that's the, the key uh, where, where, wh or why I like these, these answers is that they help you explore further and they also challenge your assumptions. As a coach, you can't assume, oh yeah, everything at the last minute must be a, must be a, you know, a scheduling issue. Maybe not, maybe it was one time. You know, if it's every time, that's different. But again, it's just another means or another way to ask the question. Then the internal stakeholders, I love these guys, you know, nothing, you are amazing. The team should not stop anything that it is doing as it continues to make an impact globally. You know, and then nothing at this moment and not sure. I mean, that's brilliant. You know, the, your internal stakeholders are happy. And I think that's the thing that you have to keep in mind, at least from my perspective, is that as a, as a team coach, if your internal stakeholders are your, is the team's primary customer, you've got to be careful that you don't upset that balance with the changes that you're making. And I think that's one thing that is often overlooked as a team coach. It's like, yeah, we want to improve the team. Yeah, but you know, uh, are you ensuring that the relationships that they've established and are working for the company are maintained? So that adds a level of complexity at times, which I think sometimes people will go, like I've seen a couple of, uh, uh, and these are big, you know, these are the elite management consultant companies who come in and say, this business needs to change in this way, but they don't map how it's going to impact the other businesses that are dependent on that business. And I think that's one thing that you don't want to be known as the person who came in and yeah, sure, the team was really good, but they impacted other people's uh, productivity, you know? So that's, for me, really, really important uh, as, a, as, a, as a team coach. I, I feel like a doctor almost. You do not want to in, produce any harm right, into that system. Otherwise, in my mind, you've been a you've been a failure. Then the team members are quite interesting. You know, what can you stop now? Doubling work, consequence of being higher cost, and then wasting time, not having a record of work done, and debating, which I find interesting. That you know they've they've used this venue to uh, share that. And it, 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 to me, indicates that maybe there's a workflow issue, which could also then provide you with another way, if you're comfortable with it, of working with them and improving their processes, not just working with their team, but also working with their processes. So anything come up for uh, uh, you out there in, in, in TV land, so to speak? Because and again, I, before you answer, what I'm, what is important to me is that you just use this as a, uh, uh, as a source of questions, and don't don't glom onto it, or don't hold onto it tightly, thinking this is the uh, the you know the be all the end all the the, the final version of the facts, because fundamentally. They could have been having a bad day. They could have been, uh, you know, the day before they did the, the, the survey, someone could have come down hard on the team for something and they could just be very negative. So that's the thing to keep in mind as well. It may be a snapshot, but it's not the, it, it's not written in stone like, uh, like Moses tablets. It, it, we're working with individuals. So things flow, they ebb, they flow, they change. So keep that in mind as well, please. I was just thinking as well, uh, you know, uh, cross-functional teams or project teams, they need to be working together at least a month for us to then use the report. Otherwise, um, just like if it's a brand new team leader, leave it a little while 
before the report takes place, that's more useful. Sean. Agreed. I agree. Yeah. I think Sean. Emma, Emma came up with you first. So I want to give her space. Oh, sorry. I didn't see that, Emma. Pardon me. Yeah, I went off mute because Mohammed put his camera and I thought, oh, does he want to ask a question? I'll shut up. Did you want to ask anything, Mohammed? Okay, okay. Um, mm, I was just thinking about um, 360 in an individual context where one is off. I remember when I, in my corporate life being trained about recency bias, for example. And I was just mm. thinking that if you're making a comment about a team, you might actually just be thinking about an individual from that team that most recently was in touch with you and making a comment about the team in general. I don't know, it's a bunch of individuals. And I don't know, just wondering about that. I don't know if I've articulated that. Properly. Oh, it's a great question because uh, it, Am I answering the question in order to be better, or am I answering the question in order to redress or address a perceived grievance in the past, or mm. let it in? So you're absolutely right, Emma. It, it is difficult, and that's why I say it's it's really more of a it, it, it's not written in stone. It's it's, an, it's a set of impressions, and knowing how humans are, the impression can change within a half an hour, right? Mm. So if you're really hungry, I, well, I, I liken it to my kids. You know, at 4.30 in the afternoon after a long school day, they're all getting hungry and angry, right? Feed them by five o'clock and they're completely different individuals. <laughs> so that could be the same thing. They may have had a very long day or they've been on the line for very long or they've been in meetings. They haven't, you know, they've got phone calls building up. Now I've got to answer this, you know, this darn survey because, blah, blah, you know, or someone say, oh yeah, you know, the first thing in the morning, it's, uh, you know what, I'll, I'll answer it nicely. I've got a cup of coffee, I'm reading the newspaper, I'm gonna think about it. So you bring up a point that is so important. And that's why I think, you know, relying on, and, and just using it as a way to stimulate your curiosity and ask questions and, you know, and, and do the analysis. You're bang on there. And I agree, and when we send it out, obviously um, try not to put too much there so because a lot of people don't like reading um, it says in there remembering this is at team level your experiences of the team as a whole so it is um, if they only work with one person that can also be addressed is this a person that should receive the report if we want team level data so the team together with the team leader and, you know, the exec sponsor when they'll step in, decide who the report goes to. And obviously we as the um, coach stress and, you know, sometimes with humour, now make sure it's fair, you know, those who love you and those who may have had some, you know, niggles recently. So it may be if it's just one person who interacts with one member of the team, they're not the right person to fill it in. Mm. Thank you for that, uh, Claire, because I, I keep, you know, I, it, I it, it, you know, how you collect the information is, is really, really important. So yeah, thank you for that. And, and I think the um, one thing that um, I do state uh, and I have stated to people is like, look, if you've got a really big issue with someone and it's going to prevent you from answering the question fairly, can you let us know? You know, and, 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 you know, send me a text, here's my number, or here's my email, if they're, you know, because that then is also an opportunity for us to do some one-on-one -on -one coaching with the team, you know, members or the team, whomever, so that we can, you know, uh, maybe start working on dropping the, the, the hurdles that are in front of them, uh, so that they can start working together as individuals. But that, that's only happened twice to me in my 12-year career in, in Catter specifically working with boards and stuff like that. So, you know, it, 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 and I think that's the thing about being a team coach, you need to give everyone options so that they feel safe communicating in a way that won't come back to them. That, you know, some people are just complainers. Other people are like, well, you know, that this thing happened and it's still upsetting me, but I don't know how to deal with it. You know, if you can give them support, it also lends, uh, you know, lends some credibility to you as a coach and may also then provide you with other opportunities 
to coach individuals on the team. I'm, uh, if, if you get into that, you have to be like, uh, be prepared for, you know, uh, uh, some challenges because I, I, I don't know how you, Dr. Claire, you know, how would you handle that? Because I know you don't have an, uh, you know, you're way more skilled than I am. And, you know, coaching a team and individuals seems to be something you can handle well. I would always be reluctant just because I don't want to let a bias form that would, you know, prevent me from uh, supporting the team fully. Mm -hmm. So just on one thing just before that that came up, um, with one team, people from um, different divisions were inputting data and that was important. And um, there was two divisions where sadly there'd been um, cost cutting and this was, um, you know, a budgeting reporting team. So in that respect, um, we did two reports, one report with those people in and the narrative data was brutal. And it was the way they were feeling right at that point as a stakeholder. And then we did another report without them in. And so we kept that in mind when we were doing the team coaching and the feedback. And, um, you know, that helped the team because there was things that were in their control and weren't in their control. And what was the second question? <laughs> I didn't have any. I think Sean has one. If you're asking, mother. Ah. Well, yeah. Because I'm sorry. I was just looking while you were uh, answering that. Uh, Sean asked about. It says there seems like there are some elephants in the room that aren't being talked about. How much psychological safety is there for the team to address issues? Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about that because, from my perspective. Perhaps that is a session of a team coach that you could hold with the team and say, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, and be, you know, be say, hey, I, I, I'm, I'm sensing this and maybe I'm wrong, but are there, is there anything that needs to be discussed that is, you know, that we need to explore that's preventing the team from moving forward? And I, if, if they're reluctant at first, bring it up again, you know? It, it's not, and I think that's the end of the, that's the thing about working with the team. Just because you've dealt with one thing at one time doesn't mean that you won't be going back and addressing it again, right? Oh, very good point, Emma. Yep, they might need mediation. If it's really that bad, absolutely. If it's really, and, 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 and to be frank, in that case, if you feel that they might need, need mediation, I would work with the team leader and maybe bring in HR. Because I don't know if that's something you as a team coach want to get involved in. You know, on one hand, you want to get involved, but I don't know if you want to get involved with the stickiness of interpersonal, uh, let's say, uh, disagreements and things like that. Right? Uh, unless you feel comfortable. But that, that's my, my sense. I, I would then uh, defer to HR and let the company deal with it. You're there to work with the team. Their employees aren't getting along together. I'm not so sure how much responsibility you can take for that. What do you think, Claire? I think it goes back to contracting what has been agreed in this. And at that point is when we share what we do as team coaches and what we, um, you know, the way we team coach with confidence around what is in and out of the contract. And if someone's not comfortable about that, then yeah, make sure that's up front. So um, I yeah. think we're at the, 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 the end of our, our time together. Uh, again, my apologies for the technology issues. Uh, very frustrating. Yet I, I really appreciate Emma's and Sean's questions as well as the, you know, the, the Claire helping me out. Is there anything else that you, you know, that you, that's coming up for you that you'd like resolved before we end our time together? Is there anything? Okay, seeing that you're all very quiet. If there's any, uh, so we're gonna, Claire's gonna send out, make sure that sent, uh, the brochure sent out the, 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 the TAP 360 sample report. 
Uh, it's going to include my name, my address, or my email address, my telephone number. I'm honestly like very, very happy to work with you if you've got questions about you know, how to use this or, or anything that comes up with the TAP360 because I think this is a fantastic tool. And fundamentally, it saves me so much time and so much aggravation mm. having to ask people questions. You know, an interview. I don't mind interviewing, but having to ask the same question seven times to seven different people on a team can sometimes wear thin. And that's, I think, you don't want that to come across with your team as well. So, again, that's my offer to you. Uh, is there any, uh, any closing remarks that you'd like to make, uh, Samira, regarding ethics? Well, that would have taken a little bit more time and um, maybe a very quick overview. Uh, the data is confidential, not to be shared outside the circle. Uh, the team is agreeing, the team itself that we're contracting with are agreeing to share that data that uh, should be taken in place. The data that we take to gather information such as emails, the platform, the privacy policies of the platform, uh, also the role of the coach, because we don't want to confuse the team from giving feedback and you know, um, uh, administrating the whole thing and the role of the coach. So we might need some help from other team members. And also we also do some contracting in that area, just in case if we are external to BMC and we are using whether this tool or any other tool and we are receiving any commissions or, or um, you know, side fees, that should be clearly stated. Maybe that's for, from, from the, ICF first competency and the ethical considerations. That's what's coming up in my mind right now. And then the other thing I always um, put in contracting at the start is if I am having supervision, um, I may not have supervision with that team, but we write that in the contract right at the start, just in case we do. So that's up front as well. Thank you, Arne. That was extremely um, thorough. And the training is three and a half hours. It's highly interactive where you practice. And then the assessment is feeding a report to one of us as if we're the team leader. So that's the very practical assessment side. And then basically you get a user license that you don't have to renew it every year or it's just there. And when we ever update the report, we just provide complimentary updated training to any of the people with the user license. Um, thank you all for attending. Thanks, Samira, for the snippets there as well. And lovely to see you all. Thank you so much for your time. I really enjoyed this. And I hope you all have a great uh, week, the remainder of the week. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Emma, Mohammed, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>